Okay, we're live. Hello, everybody. Sorry for the technical difficulties. My name is Cricket LaFond, and I am the director of the Clear Lake Public Library located in West Central Wisconsin. Welcome to the fifth in a series of Badger Talks presented by UW-Madison in collaboration with Amory, Augusta, Clear Lake, Ellsworth, Ladysmith, and Prescott Public Libraries. Our next Badger Talk is Thursday, May 12th at 6 p.m. The topic is Fantastic Fungi with Glenn Stannis. Information can be found on the Badger Talk website, badgertalks.wisc. Dot edu slash events. I'd like to welcome our speaker tonight, Susan Carpenter. She has an MS in Botany and an MS in Science Education from UW-Madison. She is the Native Plant Garden Curator and Gardener at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Arboretum and works with students and the community to maintain and monitor a four-acre garden representing the plant communities of Southern Wisconsin. She also leads a conservation project that involves students and the public in documenting and studying native bumblebees. Susan will answer questions at the end of her presentation. So I will stop screen sharing and welcome Susan. Well, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and share my screen. And just to be clear, is it showing a full screen um, title page, Cricket? It is, yes. Good. All right, great. Well, thank you, Cricket, so much for um, inviting me to um, talk with you uh, all about gardening with native plants. It's one of my favorite topics. So as I mentioned, I could probably go on and on about it, but I, wanna, I will try to hold it to the time so we can have some questions at the end. Um, I'll just say that down here in southern Wisconsin today, we finally had a little touch of spring. Uh, I understand tomorrow it'll be gone again, but um, we're just, we're as eager as everyone I'm sure up there is for a little bit more spring weather and a little less winter at this point. Um, okay. Uh, I want to just start by talking about native plant gardens and landscapes and kind of some general characteristics and features that I think of when I think of these, uh, this topic. And um, this is a picture of our, one of our gardens at the Arboretum. Um, so when I think of these kinds of landscapes, I think of them as being healthy and diverse. And when we think of land, um, land health and land diversity, what we're really talking about is everything about the land. So animals, plants, air, soil, water, um, all of the things, all the components, both living and non-living that go into uh, that are in a landscape and really inherent in it. And when, so when we talk about land health, we're talking about those components being healthy and we can be kind of um, you know, intuitive about that. There would be ways to measure or quantify it, but, uh, but I think we could easily tell uh, whether something's healthier or not as healthy by how much is living there, by what, by are the, are the elements thriving? Is the water, um, is the water pure? Is the water, is the air clean? Are the plants and animals healthy? So those are some things that, um, that I think about. Diverse means just what it says. And that means that there are many, many components. So when we talk about animals or plants, we're talking about a lot of different elements. So insects, there are multiple, multiple kinds of insects, there's multiple kinds of plants. And this kind of gives the whole system a little bit more uh, resilience and a little bit more, um, a, a little bit more ability to handle change and uh, disturbance as it is normally, as it would really uh, regularly happen. Um, these landscapes and gardens are full of life. So as I go through my talk, I'm going to emphasize this along the way. Um, but by, that, by this, I just mean when, when I go from taking an area that's just pretty much a lawn and I convert it into a native plant garden, I automatically see a right away, really, a huge increase, not of course, in just in the plants that we planted there, but in the insects, the birds, the small mammals, bigger mammals who are using that area. That's very important. Um, these gardens are sustainable, meaning for the most part, these are perennial plants and these are 
uh, organisms which are going to be living in the area, their life carrying out their life cycles in the area, and being able to be uh, to you know to sustain over time. So it's not that we just put the plants in and then later we have to come back and like do other things with the plants. Is it? It won't stay the same as the I'll say an original planting, but it will um, persist as a system and keep going. And we can look at some patterns uh, for that too. These gardens and landscapes are actually maintained with low inputs. But here, what I mean by low inputs is um, we don't water. We don't do supplementary water watering after we do the initial plantings for the most part. Um, we don't use fertilizer. That's actually, rec we recommend against using fertilizer in these gardens because it actually, that actually encourages plants that are not the native plants. Um, it encourages a lot more top growth instead of the root growth, which is kind of where native plants are more putting their energy. Uh, we don't mow, obviously, uh, an area like what you see here. We're not mowing that during the season. So we don't have uh, mowers or even trimmers and that kind of thing that we're using on it during the growing season. Uh, the only input that we, oh, and then we don't use any insecticides or when we use herbicides only in a very limited um, capacity. Like if I have a problem a uh, weed, like say crown vetch ends up in one of these gardens somehow, and that's impossible to get rid of uh, if it's spread a bit, if spreading through the area, it's, it's impossible to get rid of it by hand weeding. Then we uh, might do some spot treatments on that, stimulate it with fire maybe in the beginning of the season and then do some spot treatments and that has tends to get uh, rid of it. So we're always watching and seeing what we might need to do with that, but we use no insecticides and that would be another input that we can totally eliminate. The only inputs that we do um, need to use are our own energy. So we do a lot of weeding and we in fact do some editing, if you will, of native plants. So we're going through, um, maybe we see a native plant that's moving in and it's kind of taking over in this small area of a garden. We, we work, you know, we work against it too. We kind of try to get it at a, at a vulnerable time and reduce its numbers so that the other plants will still have, a, have room and space to grow. And we also use our time and energy in watching the garden and learning about it as much as we can. And this kind of comes, this kind of goes without saying, you don't really need to try to learn about them as you're working among these plants. They're going to be teaching you all the way along. These these native gardens are of a place. So for example, here in Southern Wisconsin, our garden, this garden that I work in is um, really represents Southern Wisconsin. So we have like a prairie garden and it, a tall grass prairie garden or sand prairie garden. And these are actual, they're actual models of those types of vegetation in our lands, you know, in the broader landscape in Southern Wisconsin that our gardens are modeled after. So we do use uh, actual places, at, our designer uses those as actual models for selecting the plant species that are in our smaller areas of, of the garden. So they really tell you that you're at a place. And if, you, if I were to um, have the good fortune to come and garden in your area, because there's, there are, there's some overlap between the vegetation we would see in the two places, but there's also some non-overlap, I would be looking at, um, I would be looking at the species that are from that region and using those instead of any that I know from down here. Um, the plants are adapted to the climate and to the soils of the location. So this allows for um, being say drought, uh, drought re resistant or um, resistant to temperature extremes that other maybe ornamental plants or other traditional plants would not be. And the soils as well. Uh, so the soils can vary across a very small area. In our garden, we have really in four acres, we have a huge range of different kinds of soils. But if, you, if the plants are matched to the soil type in each area, uh, it works out quite well. So you don't wanna be using um, plants that are vastly different from the soil or from the climate that you're in. And these gardens are always changing. They're, they're dynamic and they're supposed, that's supposed to be, ex I mean, I would expect that. So when we start out with the garden, it might look one way and as it evolves and as the plants 
continue to grow and reproduce. And um, some of them are maybe more prevalent at the beginning and others, you know, fade back. Uh, and then others are more, you don't see them much at the beginning of a planting. They're rather small, but then they, they come into more prominence, different methods of reproduction. So there's lots and lots of changes and things to admire and learn about. And they're just so interesting. It's just a fascinating kind of gardening. There's always something new to learn and always something kind of surprising that catches your attention and can turn into something that becomes a really strong interest. So tonight, I just want to give you a really a quick little seasonal tour, if you will. I mean, uh, at this time of year, we, we see so few plants out already that I like to give a little bit of inspiration that we're going to have a season um, go through with all these beautiful plants. And then I want to talk a little bit about water and rain gardens specifically. Uh, water and rain gardens are uh, something that's quite uh, quite in the you know public interest right now because of the way that our uh, that climate change is uh, altering our rainfall patterns. We're getting bigger storms. We're getting more storms, and we're getting bigger storms closer together, adding up to um, adding up to more water on the landscape to deal with. Well, we're also getting drought too. So there, the extremes are also part of. Of this pattern, but I'll focus on water and rain gardens in that section. And then a little section about life in your garden. And this is where I'm reminding us that when we're growing these plants, it's not just the plants, we're also going to see a lot more life coming into the garden and kind of ways to just examples and ways to think about that a bit more. Focusing in on some particular pollinators um, specifically as I go through that. And then uh, give you some sustainable gardening tips and just suggestions that would increase your uh, the resilience of your garden, the um, pollinator value of your garden, some of the other ecosystem services, the ecosystem functions that gardens have uh, in our landscapes. So this is the um, University of Wisconsin Madison Arboretum garden, uh, the native plant garden, and it's right here at our visitor center. Uh, that large building in the center there is our visitor center. And uh, the garden is accessible by, uh, it's actually, a, these paved paths are actually accessible by wheelchair, even when the visitor center is not open. So we have gentle slopes going up the hill there where the prairie garden is. And then we can also see that this garden has different areas. It has a shaded maple area there at the that those maples there that are just turning our, um, that, that's our maple basswood garden. We have um, some, we have the prairie gardens, of course, and we have a lot of different like smaller vignette gardens that I would um, invite you and hope that you would be able to come and visit sometime. If you, next time you're in Madison, I hope you can come. Um, this garden is nestled between our horticultural garden to the right and above um, here. That is our tree and shrub collection well known at the Arboretum for all the gorgeous, this time of year for all the gorgeous flowering trees, which are not quite blooming yet, but our magnolias, our lilacs, our um, crab apple collection is unparalleled, and then all these other trees. So there's about 4,000 woody plant specimens in that collection, really a, um, a wonderful collection. And then at the left, you can see a little bit of the Curtis Prairie, a very well-known uh, prairie that is um, known, well, worldwide because it is one of the very first prairies that has ever that had ever been um, attempted to be restored from degraded farmland and uh, at the time that that was that that project was undertaken no one really knew how to do it so um, lots of experiment trial and error and that theme continues on to the current day because in the native plant garden there is always an element of uh, trial and error. And, and when I talk with people about their own gardens and their own questions about their gardens, I'm often finding myself saying, hmm, that's interesting. Here's what I know about it, but try if you try it, let me know what you learn. So we all have a place to learn and share with others about what we're finding out. Um, the, we're also surrounded here at the Arboretum Gardens and the Arboretum itself, which is 1,200 acres here in Madison, uh, by the neighborhoods of Madison. And we're entirely surrounded. The highway goes by on our southern, uh, you know, southern part of this area that you're looking at here. And um, so we are connected in some ways with the neighborhood through stormwater movement, mostly 
from the neighborhoods to us because we're a little lower lying. Um, and pollinators travel back and forth across these, um, across these landscapes. There's no trouble at all for a, a bumblebee to fly from this garden up to the neighborhood and back um, if it needed to, to forage. So um, the garden that uh, the garden that I'm working in at the Arboretum was started about 20 years ago, um, and we had a garden designer. So our garden designer is Daryl Morrison, um, and he is um, has been actually this is I think quite unusual. He has been uh, involved in this project from 20 years ago when he designed the garden from scratch to now where he even just designed a new garden area for us last summer, where we had an opening, uh, a new opening created when we lost a tree. So he drew designs like you see this on the left, um, which is a very detailed drawing and it's just a tiny section of our garden. This is our homeowners uh, demonstration and children's garden area. And you can see the curvilinear paths. Uh, those are pathways, uh, grass pathways and a little paved pathway. Um, there are the different colors, those little dots, which I know you can't see, but those little dots, when you look at this on a, a you know, map sized version, uh, will told us, told me where do the plants go and which plants are they? So this kind of design was available for certain areas of the garden and uh, other areas were just left as, you know, this will be a prairie area. So you know, we, we planted it in a slightly different way. But in here we laid out the plants and you can see this little building in the middle is a small building. We use it for research, but the way that it fits into the garden is that it has the north side there above, uh, you know, to the north is pointing up on this map. So uh, there you can see there, there are different species than what you see on the south side. And that's because the exposure at the north side of the building is a lot different and the light and the soil conditions, the moisture conditions are a lot different right there near the building at the north than they are to the south where the south is getting a lot of sun, um, a lot more, it slopes down from the, on the south there. So there's a different, uh, just a different type of microclimate near the building. So it's nice to be able to demonstrate that the microclimates with our buildings that are within the garden. So not everyone wants to start a garden like this. Um, our gardener is very, um, he's very experienced with garden design. And you can see here in the picture on the right that there are those curvilinear uh, paths that gives a little element of mystery as you pass through the garden. You can see where you should go, but you don't know quite what's around the corner. You can see that the, there's areas of light and shadow there are different forms of plants. So there's places where there's taller vegetation and shorter vegetation. And you can get a little sense in this picture with the different colors of, um, you know, that the plants have, a, that the plants color schemes are kind of changing throughout the season as well. So you can kind of see in both of these pictures how that designer's eye has brought um, this garden to life. But we don't always, we. I don't recommend that, you know, everyone's going to have a garden designer to help match plants to the site. And you may not, uh, and that just may not be what you're going to do. Many of you have probably already been gardening with native plants and, and really a common way to do this in a way I like, I like to do it in my own home is to pick a few favorites that I like and that can grow well together and put them in, in an appropriate place at my house. So I have a north side, I put some woodland plants there and, a, and an east, southeast facing side, which is where my prairie plants are. And then the plants kind of move themselves around a little bit. Um, so there's lots of ways to get started and to keep your garden going over time. Here we have a cardinal flower on the, on the left, that red one, a really well known hummingbird um, plant. And then the white ones are that, that tall spike is the um, culver's root. And then the mountain mint is the more flat topped white one. And then the sweet black eyed Susan is the tall uh, black eyed Susan a relative there in the, in the background. So here at the upper right, we have a little hummingbird visiting the um, giant purple hyssop. And this is a plant that grows really well in uh, down here in shaded, semi-shaded areas, and it, and we have a goldenrod, um, the elm leaf goldenrod here 
that's growing uh, with it in the semi-shade. And then of course we have some of our native grasses. This is the drop seed and the little blue stem. And there's a few little goldenrods mixed in there. This is the very end of the season when those are creating seeds and the birds come into these areas and just really work around on those, um, on those drop seeds and on, the other, on some of the other grasses and really um, get a lot of nutrition in that space. So um, we have uh, a lot of times I get questions about what can I grow that isn't so tall because I have a small space at home or maybe a walkway where I don't want things just falling down on it. I get that because we have a lot of walkways that uh, end up with the plants kind of flopping down on them and we have to trim back a little bit. We trim them pretty high because then the stalks of the plants are stiffer and they can hold the other plants from flopping over. So we don't cut them right at the bottom if they're not you know, if they're, if they're still sort of sturdy and we just cut them a little higher. But here I have a short grass planting on purpose. And this is a low profile garden. And our new garden that we planted last uh, summer is somewhat similar to this one. There's a few variations with the species, but we have June grass here. That's that brownish one. This picture was taken in uh, early July. So June grass would be finished for the year at that point. And those seeds, those brown uh, stalks there are the seeds being dispersed. We have drop seed, side oats, grama grass, um, and little blue stem in this planting. We have some little purple harebells, they're tiny uh, in there, and a prairie smoke, and uh, some. there's some black-eyed Susan there, there's some liatris. So during different times of year, we have different flowering plants that are mixed in here that come up and catch our attention. And then this is our, uh, garden, which is a tall grass prairie garden. So mesic prairie just means that, uh, mesic means medium. So when we have dry and wet, mesic would be right in the middle. And a mesic, uh, the mesic garden has a kind of medium soil moisture. It can dry down, or it can be a little wetter, uh, but the plants do well either way. And this is a picture taken in about um, May or late May, um, where the spider warts are blooming, that's the purple. And then the yellow is just the beginnings of the um, ox eye or early sunflower blooming. And we have some little plants like down in the foreground, there's a little uh, heuchera there, alum, prairie alum root. And you can kind of see the different textures of the plants. So you've got the grasses, tall grasses that are not very tall yet, but you know that, that they're still just starting to, they're just start, starting to grow vegetatively. Um, you have with the spider warts there in bloom in the morning, but each spider wart fl flower only lasts for about half a day on a sunny day. So by noon or so, they've all closed up and the buds for tomorrow are just, are, you know, are going to grow um, the next day. So the, it blooms over a period of weeks, but each flower only lasts for one half a day, roughly. And here is our black oak savanna. So here we have um, a, an area which actually has very uh, well-drained soils. There's sand, kind of sandy soils here. It happens to be the location of the old um, farmhouse of the farm that the Arboretum was, um, that was the land use before the Arboretum was uh, purchased it. And you can see a little place here in the grass toward the right, a green, um, there's a greener area there, sort of midway, um, you know, mid ground that is actually on the site of an old cistern that goes down into the ground about 25 feet and it's filled with soil now, but it's different enough and it still has a different relationship of moisture at the bottom than the turf grass around it. So that's why it looks a little bit more lush and a little greener. One thing I do wanna point out in this picture besides seeing some of the species that I mentioned moments ago, the spiderwort, the alum root, and, um, and others, uh, is this idea, and it, it's quite helpful if you're doing native gardening and you want to convey to say neighbors or passersby or your friends or whoever, that you are making an intentional garden with plants that look a little bit wild, is to have this kind of an edge on it. So lawn or a lawn path comes up to it and then it's got a pretty distinct edge. And, it, and it's nice to have a curving edge, it just gives a more natural 
uh, look to it, but um, that can be very helpful. So you've got the mowed grass and then you've got a little edge and then you've got your garden. And it gives, it really gives a, a cue to care showing that you are doing this kind of gardening intentionally, not just kind of letting your yard go, which um, you sometimes might get a comment about. Pretty soon, these plants are just coming up out of the ground now. I was in this area just yesterday uh, and the columbine, the, the golden alexanders in the center there and the wild geraniums are just barely, their leaves are just barely out of the ground now here. And, but in a few weeks, this is what they'll be doing. A lot of blooming, and these are some of the earliest ones. And this is another case where we have a um, building and a north, we're on the north side of a building. And so as we are near the building, there's actually very much moisture. And right now I have woodland flowers coming up there, like hepaticas are blooming. There'll be some spring beauties there shortly. Um, but as you move away from the building, becomes a little bit, even a short distance, like 10 feet, becomes a little bit drier and a little bit warmer and not quite as shaded. And so that's one place where you, if you planted a plant close to the building and it just didn't seem to be thriving, it might need a little more light and it might need a little more and little different conditions. And you might want to move it and see how it, and see how it does further away. These plants will, um, these plants, the the geraniums um, spread will spread by rhizome or kind of spread out just the plant itself. This is the uh, golden alexander spreads by seed and so does the columbine. And the columbine likes to come into the edges now. So when the garden gets more filled in and more um, tightly uh, packed, the plants are more tightly packed over time, then the columbine will be like right at the edge because it has to, it's not long lived and it needs to reseed itself with, uh, and so that's why it ends up at the edge where you kind of, you know, just a little bit more disturbance, or you can create a larger area of disturbance and seed some of those seeds into that. And then the next year you'll have a, another larger group of um, columbines probably. And in the maple basswood garden, which is our shadiest garden, we really have low light levels when, uh, when the leaves have come onto the trees a little while till then, uh, but here we have the wild ginger, which is a good ground cover, covers everything, and the little maidenhair ferns are coming up, so it's, this is pretty early in the season. This garden also has a lot of spring ephemerals, other little wildflowers that are only up for a little while, while the trees are still getting their leaves, and then they finish their life cycle, and we don't see them until the following spring. But ginger will be, ginger does bloom at early spring, the flowers are very obscure. They're underneath all these leaves and their um, seeds are dispersed by ants. So the ants will take the seed away from the plant and bring it somewhere else and drop it off. And if you begin to recognize the seedlings of the ginger, you can find them around in different places. And that's uh, also a way to spread ginger around, um, not just having it spread by its own stems that can just spread um, you know, from a main plant out into a larger area but it'll be green all, su all summer long. So it makes a nice ground cover. And these are two plants. Uh, I have found the prairie smoke blooming already. These are just the two first prairie plants to bloom. So we have a tiny little, some tiny little prairie smokes that have barely started blooming. And here are the flowers, they're pendulous, they hang down. And then after they're pollinated by a bumblebee, they tip up. And after they tip up and the seeds develop, you have that kind of wispy looking, parts to the flower. Those are the styles extended, and those become the wind dispersal mechanism for the seeds. Each one of those has a fruit attached to it, and it can carry it away from the plant. Otherwise, the, the plant is rather short and small. The leaves are just really compact there on, on the ground. Shooting star is similar in terms of the flowers. It's a pendulous flower, and here you can see in the center there, a bumblebee is uh, on the flower. And it has to buzz the flower. So it flies in, attach it, you know, hangs onto the flower, sh uh, sh shakes the flower with its uh, vibrating its flight muscles. And then the pollen dusts down onto the bee and the bee can groom it and groom it until it uh, can put it onto its, uh, onto a storage. Um, so that, that yellow ball there that you see on that bumblebee is the pollen that it's gathered, that it's groomed off of its body and packed onto that structure and then it can fly back to the colony and um, bring the pollen back for the 
developing bees that are in the colony. So the shooting star has the same situation with the pendulous flowers that then go upright and except it has a capsule for the flowers. So that little capsule there in the center, when it's brown and mature, it'll open and the seeds will be in there and you can take them like a, like a salt shaker and just turn, the, turn that over when it's mature and get some of those seeds. Shooting star is an ephem a true ephemeral though. You will see this, the leaves now, but after this blooming sequence of several weeks time, the leaves will turn yellow and die back. And that is the plant's life cycle for 2022. And it'll be dormant then in the soil until next year. Here we have June grass when it's in bloom. It's just a lovely, short, cool season grass. And then the prairie phlox, which is a beautiful uh, plant that grows in similar areas, kind of dry habitats are suitable for these. And then later, a little later in the season, we have the butterfly milkweed here. This is the orange one and the white sage is growing with it in this picture. White sage is a rather tall, big plant that we, um, when we originally planted it uh, in the garden, we had just a, a lot of, we planted the plants about a foot apart, a foot on center uh, throughout the area, but we mixed in the species, all the different species. And when we planted the, um, the white sage, I was pretty sure we'd made a horrible mistake because of the first few years, it just grew very fast and it flopped over everything and kind of laid down on top of other plants and it was really distressing. But now it turns out over time that, uh, and we did pull off um, flowering stalks of it and so forth, um, but now it looks much more like this within the garden. And this is kind of what it looks like more in nature where it's just kind of in, interwoven in between the plants. So I guess if I was suggesting it for anyone at, at the point of a new garden, I'd say get everything else started first in your, in your dry mesic prairie, and then come back with maybe one uh, white sage and put it in somewhere where it can um, behave itself a little better. <laughs> and then this is another garden that um, gets uh, actually a lot of moisture flow over it. Uh, it's in the path of the between the building downspouts and our um, rain garden, which I'll talk about in a moment. But this is a um, this is our friends of the Arboretum Terrace Garden, and it has at this point of the season you can see those tall purple spikes, Liatris uh, prairie um, blazing star, Liatris pycnostachia, and that is a um, these flower heads start blooming at the top. The purple at the top is the bloom, and then they're blooming all the way down. And we also have um, the white uh, one there in the midground is uh, Culver's root again, and that's individual little flowers. So they start blooming at the bottom of the spike and bloom on their way up. And then we have in the foreground here, the Joe Pye weed, uh, just it's really short in this picture, but it's uh, going to get much, much taller. And it looks like there's a little bit of phlox too mixed in with that. So you have here, you can see here, appreciate here maybe some of the different textures. We have a plant here in the, in the mid ground that isn't blooming yet, but has kind of a yellow green cast to it. And that is the um, grass leaf goldenrod. So once that's blooming, that'll have kind of a yellow, it'll be kind of yellow across that whole top. In the background, you can see some irises. You can see some blue joint grass, which is a um, water, kind of a moisture loving native cool season grass. So the seed heads of that are already mature and probably dispersing seeds by the time of this uh, photo. This garden also, we can't see it in this picture, but also has a lot of little uh, wild strawberries inter, um, interspersed within the, um, within the garden. And then in July, um, here's an example of one where you'd like Wow, there, that might be the only plant in that garden. This is bee balm, of course, the native bee balm. It's a lavender color. And uh, quite a few, um, each of those heads that you see there is multiple flowers. Um, and so this is a time when, when bee balm is blooming, it looks like it may be the only thing there. Uh, but of course, when it goes out of bloom, you see all the other plants that are still um, growing there. And this was, uh, this may have been taken at a kind of early point of this garden. So remember how I said there's times in the garden's kind of development where one species might be really, really strong and then it may just kind of blend in with everything else. And that has been the case in this particular spot. Um, 
and this is our big rain garden. So um, we just for showing you what kinds of plants are there, this would be late summer, kind of August, maybe late August. There's Joe pie weed is that pink and purple, uh, very tall plant through there. There are uh, sweet black eyed Susans. There's a little bit of a uh, butterfly weed still blooming, which is interesting. Uh, there's some white um, Indian, uh, Indian plantain, um, sweet Indian plantain in the background there. And there are some goldenrods in this area. So this is a rain garden of 30 meters in diameter. It's roughly circular. And um, of course, it's the center of it is lower than the, than the uh, parts that you know, are here at the edge. Um, and it has, it has over 100 species in it, growing in it. So at any given time, the things that are blooming usually catch our eye. But you know, if we look carefully or we look at it over the whole season, we see the diversity that really is there. And this is one of the plants in that garden. One of my favorites is the bottle gentian. So it likes a moist or semi, you know, kind of a wet to mesic soil. Um, and it has these wonderful flowers. So these, these flower, individual flowers here are about an inch and a half um, tall, maybe a little bit more than that. And they're in full bloom right now. So the one, there's one here at the top that has a little tiny white circle at the top, a little white opening. And that is the place where the bumblebees go in. So this is a flower that has petals that are pleated and folded uh, um, on top of each other. And the bumblebee can go into that little hole and press the petals apart. And once it gets inside, the petals just automatically close back up again around it. And it goes around inside there and pollinates the, you know, spreads a pollen around and inside the flower. And then out it pops uh, again and the petals just close up again. So these ones that are more purple are actually already pollinated and their capsule inside is developing. And when it's fully developed, it has thousands and thousands of seeds in it. They're very small. They are um, able to be spread by, by floating on water or by just the wind, a puff of wind can move them a long um, distance. So um, this is a very, it's a very cool plant. And we have planted it in our garden. And when we first planted it, we lost, uh, or the deer came to eat it because I deer love to eat this plant. But then over time with more plants coming in and with less novelty in that area, the deer kind of moved on to other things. And now they really don't find them and they don't, they don't get to them. So we get to enjoy the, um, the flowering. And as we get toward the end of the season, um, of course it becomes aster season and goldenrod season. So here is uh, the silky aster, which is a little tiny, um, a, little, a short little aster, maybe about a foot tall, a little bit taller. And the flowers are quite large. They're about an inch in diameter or the heads are about an inch in diameter here. You can see the bumblebee there for scale. And it's, um, it does very well in dry areas, gravel soils, just rock gardens where there's hardly any soil. And it's very well adapted to um, very high light environments. So those leaves that you see at the top, there are the leaves from this plant and it has a white, they have little tiny white hairs on them and that feels so soft when you touch them. So silky aster is, the, is um, a very apt name for this plant. Very well used by the pollinators. Uh, all the asters really are. And this is a fall scene again with our mesic prairie garden. So those tall grasses that I mentioned before that were kind of short, but now they're at their full and they're in full bloom. So here are full bloom or coming into seed. So we have our, um, our Indian grass at the left and the middle there is a big blue stem. And a, a little further to the right is a, a little blue stem with that reddish color. And in this garden, we also have um, we also have cord grass and um, switchgrass. And so all of these grasses in the fall, after, every, after all the flowering plants have kind of stopped blooming by this time in October, we have this, the beautiful colors and, and uh, forms of the native grasses. There's a little side oats, um, short grass, side oats, grama grass here in the left, lower left, you can see that um, interesting ladder-like arrangement of the um, spike leaves. So water and rain gardens. Um, I do want to mention that um, this, these, this is our, uh, this is the rain garden. You can see how 
very um, varied it is, how much diversity of form there is there. And this is our rain garden. When This is one of our smaller, our smaller rain garden. When we were first planting it, we did plant it according to a planting plan. So you can see the way the small plants are all gathered there and then, you know, in their places. And then here it is a couple of years later with the, uh, um, there were a few cattails there, which we eventually uh, were able, well, we were able to um, eliminate. They weren't on the planting plan. Um, and then we have the bone set here, the white, the purple is the, um, is the uh, red milkweed or swamp milkweed, it's also sometimes called. And here's a close up of it. The flower structure of milkweed is very, very specific. And you can see the structure has five, there are five little uh, cups there at the top of the milkweed, each milkweed flower. And those are um, full of nectar. And then there's a little structure in between each of the cups that's a little place where the um, pollen is held in little packets and it has to be pulled out of that spot and it needs a pretty strong pollinator to do so. So we all know that monarchs, uh, monarch butterflies rely on milkweed exclusively as their uh, food for their caterpillars. And so here's a monarch laying her eggs on, you can't quite see her laying the eggs, but trust me, she's laying her eggs on the milkweed. And then the butterfly milkweed here, we can see an, a different kind of butterfly visiting that. As I said, it has lots and lots of nectar. So all, many, many insects will visit. But only a few insects are capable, as I said before, of pulling that po those pollen packets out of the flower and successfully moving them to a new flower. So here we have the golden northern bumblebee. These golden packets here hanging down from the legs and the um, proboscis even are milkweed uh, pollinia. And so this bee was had visited a milkweed and hopefully will go back and visit that visit a milkweed of that same species and be able to pollinate the milkweed. Butterflies are not very effective pollinators of milkweed and many other pollinators aren't. So we're talking about bees, bumblebees and big wasps and occasionally some other insects. So it's very important for the continuation of milkweed and the pro um, propagation of milkweed to have those po these pollinators available and able to um, work on those flowers. Monarchs, of course, need lots of different nectar flowers. Milkweed's only blooming for a little while. They do visit it, but what do they do the rest of the time? They need to fuel up for their migration. They need to fuel up during the season for the additional generations that they're producing. So this is a meadow blazing star, one of their very favorite flowers that they love to nectar on. And if you are, if you have meadow blazing star in bloom and you're planting it, they'll like sit on it while you plant your, um, while you plant your plants, which is pretty surprising. So I talked a little bit about pollination, uh, multiple interactions of uh, insects and animals on plants. This is a button bush, a uh, flower head. And uh, I think there were four kinds of bumblebees and a silver spotted skipper uh, visiting that head all at the same time. Obviously predation and the whole food web is a factor that we would, um, we would look for in our gardens. You are probably familiar with Douglas Tallamy's work. Um, most, most everyone has had a chance to at least um, maybe read or see one of his um, books or, or um, see one of his talks but I do encourage you to take a look for more of those. He has just wonderful pictures and uh, illustrations of the principles that we're talking about. So uh, there was a rare bumblebee that was found at the Arboretum in 2010, so about 10 years ago, uh, a little more than 10 years ago. And um, this was sent, this was picture was taken by a visitor from California. He emailed the picture later and, and uh, told us that this was a very rare bumblebee. It had been lost over most of its range. It was in severe decline. Had we we had we had it at the arboretum, but we didn't know it. And had we seen any more of them? And I mean, I had not been paying close enough attention to bumblebees to answer that question, but we did start paying attention. So we were very interested in which bumblebee species are present at the arboretum and at other sites around um, Wisconsin, and which plant species do they use? Do they all use the same plants, or do they divide? You know, do they kind of use different plants? And then how can we promote conservation and education about pollinators? So Wisconsin has 500 species of native bees and the bumblebees are just 20 species here. Um, most of the bees that we have are 
solitary bees. They live just males and females mating and the females provisioning uh, the eggs with pollen. And then the development happens over the year. There's no parental care or anything. There's no colony, no division of labor um, other than males and females. And so 85% of our species are solitary bee species. And then 15% are social or semi-social. And none of those species are honeybees. So honeybees are all by themselves a unique uh, life cycle and a unique situation for, um, for when we compare them to our other bees. They are social, obviously huge colonies because the colonies last for more than one year. And all these other bees have a, an annual life cycle or an annual colony. And they're, the honeybees are from Europe. They were brought over for um, actually making um, wax and um, and then of course they're used agriculturally now like domestic animals are shipped around uh, and used for pollination of crops and also honey of course for uh, humans. So we have ground nesting bees and those are tiny little bees you might not even notice but pretty soon we'll see them out on these early spring flowers. This is one species and then here it is coming out of its little underground chamber where it's going to lay its eggs and bring pollen to, to um, provide for those eggs, seal it off. And uh, after she's laid about 30 or 40 eggs, in the case of this species, she, her life is done. And so in a few weeks, she'll, she'll die and the males will die. And those eggs will be developing underground until next spring. Um, here are some cavity nesting bees. So other than the ground nesters that I just described, we have some that nest in little tubes and little hollows, um, hollow stems, maybe holes and logs or hollowed logs. And so they need a tiny little chamber and they do the same thing. They lay their eggs, they uh, collect pollen, they provision the uh, eggs within those tubes, they seal off the tubes. And so if you've seen those bee hotels, that's uh, this kind of bee that's using those. Um, there are other kinds of pollinators. We have butterflies and moths. And I'll just say that all the pictures that you're seeing in this slideshow are pictures that I took um, of insects, are pictures that I took while I was taking pictures of bumblebees. So you get if you start a bumblebee doing pictures of bumblebees for identification purposes, which is what, what we are doing them for, you'll also get a lot of other pictures of cool insects. And you can get them identified, butterflies, on wisconsinbutterflies.org or on a website called bugguide.net. We have flies and beetles for pollinating plants. And uh, so here they are all visiting. You can tell it's a fly if it has giant eyes, just two wings and a little tiny spike antenna. So this bumblebee mimic is actually a fly. Um, kind of interesting. When you first glance at it, you think it's a bumblebee. And I already mentioned hummingbirds. So uh, here's our, we have one species of hummingbird for the most part here in Wisconsin, and that is the ruby-throated. So um, I want to just summarize uh, with some um, points about gardening and to wrap it up with this. Um, you want to increase the number, the numbers or the abundance and the diversity of native plants in your landscape for achieving those benefits that I've been kind of alluding to all the way through the talk. We wanna plant species that are native to the area. So some of the illustrations that I was using that are based in Southern Wisconsin might not be appropriate in Northern Wisconsin or, or whatever location you might be uh, watching from. So be aware of what resources uh, you might have. And I have some references for you at the end of the talk, a link that you can access some uh, lists and uh, pollinator, pollinator planting lists and so forth where you can put in your zip code and it will provide lists based on that. Um, we wanna match, this is one of the most important things of all, match the plants to the particular site conditions. So the amount of sun, the soil type, the soil moisture, the um, maybe the exposure, like if it's on a south slope, it's going to be a lot warmer than if it's on a north facing slope. So even though there might be no shade, um, you know, there might be no shade trees around that area. So though the matching is so is is key. And but don't be um, but don't be too worried because you you will want to experiment and try things as well. And sometimes you won't know the exact characteristics that you're trying to match, but you can kind of 
um, you can put the plant there and these plants are pretty sturdy. So I had someone ask me yesterday, I've got this plant, these little blue stem and they're not doing very well because it's kind of getting shadier there. And I said, just dig them out of the ground and put them in the sun because you can move them and, and divide them. And uh, it's really, they're really quite um, sturdy that, that way. If you are moving them when they're not blooming is the, the rule of thumb. We avoid pesticides and we wanna make sure that our nursery plants have not been pre-treated, especially with systemic insecticides. So the plants that you see here on the lower left are, um, they are native plant from a native plant nursery uh, and they are definitely not treated with um, insecticides. The, uh, some of the insecticides, when the plants are treated in production, the insecticide goes into the plant and it stays in the plant. It goes into the pollen, the nectar. And so it can be a problem for um, pollinators that are using the pollen and nectar for nutrition. Um, and so it can be very detrimental. So ask, uh, if you're getting from native plant nursery, you won't have to ask, but uh, probably, but if you are getting from a different nursery, you want to ask, was it treated with an insecticide in production? And if they can't tell you, then you may want to make sure that you could, maybe you might want to try sourcing the plants elsewhere. Um, also, it's important, as I mentioned before, we use some of our energy to document what we see in our garden in photos, art, writing, and then share everything you can. Share with your neighbors, share with your family, share with your community, share with your, um, you know, share with school groups, uh, community gardens, et cetera. And, you know, you can share seeds, you can share what you've learned, you can share photos, you can share your excitement. So this is just a little quote from, uh, from uh, that I borrowed from um, a couple of prairie ecologists. They were talking about how they were measuring their prairie restorations and how well were their prairie restorations doing. And uh, they, one guy said to the other one, well, I'm gonna boil it down. We wanna see color, movement, and noise. And uh, that kind of encapsulates what I would encourage you to think about in your garden. If you have the colors of like the flowers and these gorgeous, this gorgeous um, sweat bee here, if you have the movement of a of a buckeye butterfly moving down to lay its eggs on the plant, or if you have the, the noise or the call of this gorgeous um, sandhill crane in the fall um, looking to my migration. So um, thank you to all of the um, people who make the garden possible and all of our um, bumblebee monitors and everyone promoting sustainable gardening. Uh, is the link visible to you on the screen? up at the top here, this blue link? Yes, it okay. is. If you, that link is the link that I mentioned. If you wanna take a picture of that or write it down, I'll leave this up for a second. Um, that is a link which you should be able to access a handout, which has a lot of references and other things that might be of interest to you. So thank you so very much for all of your interest and all of the gardening that I hope you get a chance to do pretty soon. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Susan. That was, wow. We did have a couple questions that came in. Sure. One is, is there a good shoreline flower? And then also it seems that he's located in Northern Wisconsin, Land O'Lakes area. So what okay. would work in that area? Right, so what I would do for, yeah, shoreline, it, it kind of fits in with that rain garden theme. We're, we know with the shorelines and the lakes and up in um, Land O'Lakes area in particular, all the Northern lakes, that the health of the lake has everything, has a lot to do with the health of the land around it, obviously. And that having shoreline natives, having natives along the shoreline and even having like trees that fall into the lake and that kind of thing really helps the fishery of the lake and the health of the lake. So um, what I would recommend for that is in the references, there are going to be some, um, of those zip code uh, zip code lists. And if you can't locate it, uh, the, anyone who wants to can just email me at the Arboretum and I will you know, pursue it a little bit with you for your particular area. But the zip code list, you can get that and then it will, it might, it will break it down to like, uh, it'll probably break it down to like plants suitable for more moist areas. Or if you have a rain garden list for your area, then you can select from that because rain garden plants are usually uh, plants that can take 
uh, moisture or they can take drying down kind of both of those. And so, because that's the, what a rain garden is, it kind of gathers the water and then the water infiltrates. So there'll be periods where it's kind of dry, but there'll be periods where it's super wet. So you want plants that can kind of go both, you know, be in both situations and not be harmed. So I would recommend um, either if there's not a shoreline specific one to go with kind of rain garden plants, but do feel free to email me and follow up with any kind of questions that are more specific to your exact spot. And this gentleman is located in Madison. So he's wondering if you have a favorite nursery to go to. And then I'm wondering, is there a list anywhere of reputable nurseries in the, in for Wisconsin? Cause I don't want to go buy a pre-treated plant. I didn't. Right. Right. Well, we, there is a listing, um, on the DNR, the DNR has a listing, uh, up to up to date listing of um, both nurseries and of companies that would do like a consultation or even do the work of uh, say a shoreline restoration or some other type of restoration. Because sometimes people have a bigger project in mind than they want to be able to do themselves exactly, but they you know they just have the if they, you know, if they want to bring in a, a consultant, sometimes a consultant will just look at you, do, do a site visit and give you a recommendation or a plan. And then you take it from there, or maybe you want some help with some of the work, depending on what the project is. So I would look, check the, check the um, DNR website for the list of uh, native plant nurseries and restoration restoration companies. It's some wording like that, but it will show up uh, if you Google that. Um, as to uh, nurseries, uh, you can, if you look up native plant nurseries in Wisconsin and Southern Minnesota, Northern Illinois, you'll, you'll Google up all the ones that we would recommend. There, there's numerous ones and there right now they're doing some, they're doing some nice um, plant sales because, you know, it's, just the time to get like today I received a whole I re, well recent this week I received a couple boxes of bare root um, plant material so the nurseries are moving those now and bare root materials if the soil can be worked you can put them directly outside or you can pot them and we're, we're potting them for our sales so. and another question is if you currently have a lawn yeah. but you want it to become a pollinator garden what do you do to your lawn? Uh, some places recommend tarping. What, what's a good method to get rid of that lawn? And yeah, then it, what's it kind the of procedure to plant? Yeah, it, it is, you're, you're bringing up a really good point, which is soil preparation and site preparation is very important. Um, kind of like when they, what they say about painting, like, you know, 80%, 85% of the job is the preparation. And that's similar. So yes, you can, you, with lawn, lawn grass has roots about, uh, an inch deep or two inches deep. So uh, I've done it in different ways. Um, really years ago, we would herbicide, a, you know, a plot that was turf grass. That's kind of fallen out of our, you know, we don't do it that way anymore. What we did last summer when we had about a 1200 uh, square foot area to plant as a new garden. Um, and we didn't really want to wait for a smother, you know, to smother all the grass, which would take, you know, quite a bit of time. Um, and it was wet right out in the open. So it would have been hard to like put the cardboard or whatever material down and keep it down. And the wind blows through there a lot. So what we did there was we used a sod cutter. We rented a sod cutter and we rolled the sod off the site. And we did get weed seeds that had been uh, in the soil under the sod. Um, you know, kind of probably worked their way through from birds sitting on a big tree that had been removed. Um, and those seeds germinated. And I was so surprised to see like a whole bunch, I mean, like hundreds of uh, pokeweed coming up in that, in that plot. Uh, they're easy to pull, they're easy to get rid of. Um, so that was the, you know, getting rid of the sod and getting rid of, um, you know, getting rid of the, the upper layer was easy. And then we just had some, you know, any deep, deep rooted um, weeds have been handled by weeding. So we don't treat our lawns at the Arboretum at all. So they are a very mixed, you know, they have a good diversity of plants. So there's, you know, little clovers. There's also, there were also native 
plant seeds that were in that soil that germinated on the first year, uh, the first few months really of that garden. So I, it, was, it was just another set of surprises actually in that, in that early going. But I've looked at the garden now. It has, you know, there are some weeds because the plants are still kind of not filled in all the way. But uh, the June grass is the cool season one that's most actively bloom, uh, growing now. And it's about four or five inches tall, little bright green tufts. And I can, you know, you can tell exactly where it's planted. Um, so the warm season grasses will be coming on a little bit later. So if the lawn is on a slope and you remove the lawn, how do you avoid erosion? Great question. Um, you can put, I mean, you can, you can put um, erosion socks on it if you, if it's that steep um, or what we, we had some areas that were not, maybe not a steep, steep slope, but more of a gentle slope. I think if I had a very steep slope, I would do it in phases and I would plant the plants closer. If I had, you know, if I had the wherewithal people power and the, you know, the funding to get the plants, I would plant them very close together um, because that would, they, they'll grow very fast in the first year, in the first season, right away. Like if you plant them early in the season, they'll be by midsummer. You're like, well, is that just this year we planted those? Um, but you want them really tight to prevent, you know, to prevent erosion. If erosion is going to be a problem. I mean, if you can divert, if you can divert water from it while it's establishing, that's good. You know, if it's like a matter of a downspout that you could, you know, hook up and ho you know, like divert somewhere else for the time being, um, that would be a possibility or, you know, just erosion socks, or there are some materials that are actually, um, it's like an erosion sock, but it has the plants in it. So it's not exactly like an erosion sock, but it's like, basically it's like blocks to, that have the plants in them. And then you use that and then they establish and the whole thing just kind of becomes a, um, you know, becomes part of the, of the slope. If so, you were to rototill the lawn, is that a good method or do you have to wait, like rototill it now, let that stuff die? What would be yeah, a process? If you with, till, with tilling, what happens, I, I don't, I don't really recommend that over say smothering or just weeding what you get when you, you know, when you've removed the sod. And the reason is that with tilling, you're bringing up deeper, you're bringing up deeper seeds and the, and any soil that you have is probably going to have a lot of a seed bank of weeds. And we really want to give the native plants the advantage and not just keep I mean, you could exhaust some of the weed seeds by tilling and then letting it grow and then, you know, smothering that or tilling it again. Um, but you're, not, you're probably not going to get rid of all of them. So the main thing to be sure with your site is that if you have something like Canada thistle or really persistent perennial weeds, you do want to make sure you get rid of them. Um, and I had an area in that big rain garden initially that was, um, that had some Canada thistle. And that was in a case of spot treating that uh, while we weren't working in that area uh, with herbicide and that did eliminate it. We've never had it come back in there. But also we had, I mentioned the cattails and we had tons of cattails in that one garden before we started putting the plants that we wanted in there. And we just, we just did repeated cutting on the cattails. And I, I couldn't believe that that got rid of cattails because their rhizomes underground are thick and like about as big as your wrist and they're all woven together and the cattails are six feet tall. And if you just cut them off and let them regrow for a couple of weeks and then cut it again, regrow, cut again, um, three or four times the, the entire cattail thing is dead. The entire underground thing just dies. So you exhaust the plant's energy by just repeated cutting. So that, that could be a technique that would, I mean, it'll work for cattails, I know that, but um, so for someone on a shoreline that isn't, you know, where it isn't too mucky, you could try that technique if cattails are kind of taking over your planting. For a beginning pollinator garden, uh, how big of a plot do you need for it to be worthwhile? <laughs> Oh, I think you, I think that my philosophy is actually that any size is fine because 
if you, I mean, there are good lists of um, pollinator, you know, good pollinator plants, like some of those ones that I mentioned, like bee balm. And I mean, now I'm, I'm again, speaking from the Southern perspective. So I don't know, you know, some of your viewers or some of your listeners are in, um, you know, all the areas of the state. So, but in your area of the state, if you can get a poll the pollinator list with your zip code, you, you could start with any of them. And the neat, the thing to try to do is to get them, get different ones that bloom at different times of year. So that if you were a bee coming to your garden, you would be able to find something eat at any time of year. And it's good to have two or three because sometimes, you know, the bloom seasons might vary a little bit or one kind of flower might get nipped off by the rabbits or something. So it's good to have a variety of them blooming throughout the season and uh, just look at it from the bee's point of view. But as far as how many and which ones, I'd pick some of the ones that seem to be the most attractive to pollinators and those will be on the list. And then, um, and then fill them in as they, as they fit in your site. All right, I am not seeing any more questions. Okay. This has been very informative. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank oh, you you're everyone welcome. for attending. Yeah, thank you. Nope, there are no more questions.